I'm Rachel Woody. It's August 2nd. We're at Plaisance Winery Ranch. What's the official name? Ranch. We just call it Plaisance Ranch. Plaisance Ranch. And I'm here with Joe Genet and Susie Genet. So we're here for the Oregon Wine History Project for Southern Oregon. And what we're hoping to do is capture the unique family stories, of which yours is definitely one of them, and then trying to capture thoughts on where the wine industry is right now for Southern Oregon and your thoughts on where you think it might go. So we'll start out very specific to your story and then just kind of get more broad from there. Are there any stories that you want to make sure that are told on film or any questions that I should be asking, feel free to help guide the interview that way. Okay? Okay. So I think where I'd like you to start is, of course, with your grandfather. What brought him over here, the entire story of that trip, and we'll go from there. I think it was a lack of opportunity in Europe at, at, that, at that time period that brought him over here, because he was the um, firstborn in the family, so he uh, stood to inherit everything the family had, but that, even that wasn't enough to make a living, I think, it was pretty much the deal. So he. Um, um, was an adventurous soul and came to America. Ellis mm -hmm. Island and then slowly worked his way across the country to Jacksonville. I assume because of the gold rush at the time and that's, you know, the Oregon Trail, that's what was happening. So that's where he ended up. Found a, a 500 acre rundown orchard and purchased it um, and called it Plaisance Orchards. His family, are, they had vineyards in Savoy, and he, he was looking for a place to plant the grapes when he came. Yep. And then in 1905, returned to Savoy to get his fiancée and his grape cuttings to start his vineyards, and uh, returned only with grape cuttings, not his fiancée. Um, I've heard a couple stories why. One, um, her parents didn't wouldn't, knew that they would never see her again, so they didn't like that. But also the fact that he owned 500 acres, they, they couldn't believe that that was possible for one guy, a young kid like him did, or uh, to purchase 500 acres. In Europe, that wasn't possible. So they probably didn't believe he was telling the truth. <laughs> so, uh, so he returned along just with his grape cuttings and uh, eventually uh, put an ad in Quebec, Quebec uh, newspaper for a French-speaking bride and got a response. Uh, rendezvoused with them, with her and her mother in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and uh, spent a couple weeks there and got married and returned to uh, Jacksonville with the mother. The mother stayed for two years. Oh, wow. Um, and that's how we got started here. So he brought vines with him. What vines? He brought the those? cuttings. The cuttings. Yeah, yes. yeah, I think there was an assortment of cuttings, one of which was Mondeuse, um, probably Chardonnay, and maybe Pinot Noir, and I'm not for sure all of them, but I know I'm going to do this one of them that he brought. Mm -hmm. That's the major red grape of Savoie, France. Um, it's actually one of the parents of Syrah, along with a grape called Dereza. Um, and since then, we've imported the variety ourselves. I brought it through uh, Missouri State University quarantine, and uh, we have it here today. Wow. So, was he able to sell the wine commercially? Um, there's no real proof that he sold wine, and it was during Prohibition, um, mm -hmm. so it wasn't legal to sell wine. Um, he had, there's documents that say he had wine for his own use and to serve his friends, and that he always served the revenue's wine when they came to check up on him. Um, but um, he did have the first car and the first telephone in the valley, so maybe he sold some. <laughs> he was doing well even though there was Prohibition. Yeah. Okay. With the Plaisance orchards, did he do more than winemaking? Or? He uh, prunes and apricots mainly with the two other crops, and he had a big, huge uh, wood fire drying house or barn, and he dried the, the fruits and peddled them during the winter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dried apricots and prunes. He also grew wheat. And some people that we've met that knew of him older people told us that they called his, his place was called the wine ranch that they you know, they're making the wine. The cattle drives would always plan on spending the night there because of 
what happened there, <laughs> <laughs> what was shared there. Right. So it was known as the Wine Ranch. Mm -hmm. I imagine there wasn't a lot of other wine operations in town. Uh, well, there were more. Well, Peter Britt had his uh, vineyard and winery going in. He, he was a uh, not during Prohibition, of course, but even before that time, Peter Britt had already started. And then your grandfather also sold great plants. Yeah, so great vines. Mm -hmm. So, from your grandfather to yourselves, what transpired over that time period to where you now have Plaisance branch and you're making wine now, of course, too? Well, it's kind of a long story, but... Um, well, that's all right. <laughs> that's what we're here for. Um, he died at a young, young age, and um, my father um, became a logger. Actually, the family lost that original ranch during the Depression, mm -hmm. and my father was a logger. I grew up in the Applegate. Um, I uh, saw enough of logging to know I didn't want to be a logger, so I, I became a farmer, a dairy farmer. I always wanted to do vineyards, but it wasn't really economically feasible. And so uh, Daddy didn't give me a ranch, so I had to milk cows for 30 years before I got my chance. But then, uh, thanks to her help, we, we were able to do it, finally do it. Jill went to Oregon State University and then graduated from Davis in animal science and chemistry. Wow. And then he worked on the Alaska Pipeline to put himself through school. And then we decided we'd milk cows until we could buy our ranch and plant grapes, but it took us 28 years to do that. <laughs> so we finally got to plant grapes. But we did. Our, we planted a viticulture to begin with the nursery. <laughs> and it's all you see Davis rootstock and other plants. About 30 varieties of grapes. Wow. And uh, seven varieties of wood stock. Kind of. And so, what varieties do you enjoy growing that you have found grow well here? Well, Mondoos does well. <laughs> it does. Um, but it's pretty important. most all grapes do well here. There are very few grapes that don't do well here in Southern Oregon. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of our problems is a lack of focus on any one grape because mm -hmm. so many grapes do well. All the, all the other uh, Vineyardists and around here, and they're doing great jobs with a lot of different grapes. So um, I, it's hard to say which is the very best. They all make pretty good wines. What varieties do you make here? Oh, for the major ones, like I think uh, we do in the whites, we have uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Viognier, Chardonnay, um, Aligote. Uh, Luzon, um, we have a little Riesling, we have a little uh, Pinot Gris. Uh, for Reds, we have uh, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Mondeuse, uh, Carmenere, Petit Syrah, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Cabernet Franc, Movedra, Tempranillo. So we have, being a nursery first, we needed to, uh, to have the material to make the plants. So we have way more varieties of grapes than is normal for a winery. Um, the wine club likes it, but most wineries wouldn't, wouldn't think of it because it's lack of focus and um, just too complicated to make all the different wines. Uh, last year I made 11 reds, two whites and a rosé. So it's quite a bit for most wineries. So we still have the dairy cows until 2004, but we planted the nursery in 1998. So we started planting a vineyard at the top of the ranch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we were selling plants, we'd make, you know, extras for the orders, and then we, you know, plant up here until we finally had an established vineyard, and then we sold the dairy cows in 2004, and went into the beef business at that time also. Mm -hmm. How has your grandfather's history influenced where you are now, or has it? I think early in the 70s, I went to Europe when I was in college and, and eventually looked them up and saw what they were doing, that they were, you know, had vineyards and they, were, they had a co-op winery in their village at the time, so they were all taking their grapes to the co-op. and. Uh, so it was always in the back of my mind that, that I should be doing that. But how did, 
figure out how to do it was the next problem. So it took us a while to do it, but we, we got there. I think, um, and then the revisiting of them, and then some of our cousins helped us plant the original vineyards, taught us how to do the grafting. They came here um, for six years in a row. They came for six months each year and stayed here and, and taught us how to do the grafting and helped us lay out and plant the original vineyards. And um, so that was a big help, you know, and, and, and gave us some credibility in the, in the winery world. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, so it's always nice to go back and, and see what they're doing. And they all still have vineyards and viticultures. And wineries now. They, yeah. The younger kids now are starting wineries. So. Yeah, I think that's going to be incredible that not only do you have that family tie back to sport, but that your cousins were able to come out here and help plant similar to Savoy. I mean, there's so many things about that that are wonderful. Well, the communication was lost for so many years after his grandfather died, even that they didn't even know that Joe even existed, and he has the same name. You know, his right. name is Joseph Jimmy, so. Um, when he went there and wrote his name on a paper in the train station, there are only 680 people there today. It's a really small village right in the Alps. And um, so then everyone came down to the train station and he, he got to know that, you know, them and they knew that he was here. So one of his cousins became an English teacher. And that really helped because then we were able to communicate with this. We didn't speak any French then, you know. And so as time went on, we just, I mean, we're family now. Right. After all those years. It's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. And so of course you've kept really good stewardship of the ancestral history of course of Joe Genet. Can you tell us about some of the artifacts that you're allowing us to scan as we speak? Mm -hmm. We have. It, Samoa was actually its, its own country until 1868. When 18, when it, in 1868 it became part of France. The king of Italy actually even you know, lived in Savoy because it's only like 60 kilometers from the tour in Italy. Wow. So, um, so he was born in 1870, and we have we copied out of the church, um, and his grandfather registered his birth. And so we have that. And we have his graduation from school in Chambéry in 1870, and his discharge from the French army in 1890. His marriage, a uh, copy of the marriage certificate to Corinne in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho in 1912. And just a lot of pictures and letters. We have letters. From the Petard family. From the Petard oh, family, which was a French family in Jacksonville. They are all buried. The Petards and the Genes are buried in the very top of the Jacksonville Cemetery in the Catholic section of Petard. Mm -hmm. They're all up there together still. <laughs> so. And I believe some of the letters discuss growing yes. grapes. And yes. Uh, Simone Fittard uh, was nice enough to give us a letter. She found that Joe's grandfather had written her father. And in the letters, he's talking about you know the price that he's getting for his grape plants and the wine and the prunes. And so yeah, one of them talks about taking a two-day buggy trip to Medford to get yes. sulfur. Because he was by buggy and he lived actually in Germany, which is outside of Jacksonville. Oh. And it's quite a few miles out of town, a little valley. And the people that own it today, they still call it the wine ranch. When they called to tell us that they had purchased the property, they said, you know, this is Jen and George, we purchased the wine ranch. <laughs> I was like, no question where it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have to say, those records are fairly unique for us so far because in trying to communicate to granting agencies and even to the historical societies how extensive the wine industry history is for Oregon. All they have to rely on are census records where most people put on the farmer, when in fact we're pretty sure that they grew grapes mm -hmm. and made wine. So to have letters from your grandfather that actually discuss what they're doing and what they're selling it for is incredibly rich for us. Well, the, the Grants Pass High School yearbook is still today is called the Toke. Oh, That's yes. because of, of the Toke grape that was planted all over the hills around the, the city of Grants Pass. It was called Toke, Toke Heights. Heights. Oh. And the market at that time was not to make wine. It was to put the grapes on the train 
to ship it to the East Coast where the immigrants were. They were the mine rate makers. But the grapes were grown here in full Pass, prohibition. Ice Pass was the biggest wine growing area in the state of Oregon at the turn of the century. I have an old history book in the house that my mother gave me. And there was a man named George Carson, and I have a picture of him, a postcard actually of his vineyard over there. Mm -hmm. But uh, he went all over the, around the county and put signs on fence posts and trees that said Tokay, but no one knew what Tokay was. And then one day at the end of school, we handed out 6,000 Tokay grape cuttings to the kids and said, take this home, tell your parents to plant these grapes. And right. they did. And that's how okay, is the, the Tokay grape is the Pinot Gris grape. So oh, like, okay. Yeah. 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 Wow, that's I think that cool. book, well, I can go, actually, before you leave, I'll get it so you can see. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to see the title. You can, you yeah. can get the book. It Thank tells you. all about the history of it. Thank you, yes. So this is like the early, pre-1913. Mm -hmm. Prohibition started in 1913. Mm -hmm. So before that, Grants Pass was really big on grapes. And what did that do for the industry when Prohibition came? Well, it killed it. Yeah. <clears throat> and they also had the blight. My grandmother, they used to talk about that there was a blight. And after the blight, everyone uh, planted pears and peaches and hops. And there were a lot of hops here, too. Sugar beets. But they do plant grapes again. It's amazing what almost the 20 years of prohibition did, and here are people like the, your grandfather who knew what they were doing, and, and grapes were a successful produce for Grants Pass area. Well, you needed wineries. You needed a market for the grapes. Right. So, um, I guess all the winemakers showed up in Napa. <laughs> and they said that his grandfather, like the nuns, they both made some little history, and they passed away just in the last couple of years. But uh, they both had written a little history before in their family, and part of it is in that one book, but uh, all about the other sisters she wrote, and she said that her father, he was so very proud to be an American, that there was only one law that he considered unjust, and that was prohibition. <laughs> right. Yeah, I've heard some stories about, um, you know, the, oh, well, grandfather, you know, he came over from Europe, and he wanted to make wine, and then Prohibition came, and it nearly killed him, I think, was how they described it. And So they were trying to sneak wine into the hospital, and they mm -hmm. got in trouble, and just, it, like, it, Prohibition literally killed their grandfather, and so, yeah. So tell me more about what you guys are up to today, and where you are within the industry, your thoughts on it. Well, let's see. We, um we make about 2,000 cases a year, and uh, we self-distribute. Um, we also uh, do a lot of certified organic grass-fed beef. So between those are our two big uh, products, right? You know, um, so that keeps us pretty busy, just marketing that stuff, mm -hmm. growing the growing the cattle, growing the grapes, making the wine, bottling the wine, and peddling the wine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and wine club and and uh, we do some events, um, music and dinner events, stuff like that, to promote the wine. Um, the wine, uh, Susie goes to uh, two or three uh, growers markets a week uh, selling the beef. And we sell an entire cow every 12 days by a piece, wow. you know, my hamburger, steak, and roast, right. whatever. Um, so yeah, we, we move a lot. A lot of beef. Kind of beef and wine goes together. People like that too. You know, they'll say, oh, we have to haul. Dinner. Yeah, yeah. I love running a good piece of steak. <laughs> we have to haul our, our beef to uh, outside of Springfield for processing. Oh. Uh, we haul them up there live, and then two weeks later we go back and get the meat all packaged and ready to go. Nice. So we have uh, wine shops and restaurants and, and from Eugene. Eugene to Ashland. So we service those accounts when we're moving the beef and so Our we market almost, is not grocery store, so we keep we are just in wine shops and restaurants. Very purposefully. Yes, <laughs> actually, uh, when we first started, we kind of picked out which places our dream would be to be in, what restaurants we made a list, mm -hmm. and we realized that the higher end restaurants they don't really want your your wine to be sitting in a Safeway where someone could go over and buy it for much less than they buy it in okay. a nice restaurant. Right. And we're small enough that that's worked out for us. The, uh, the, the other thing about it is uh, you can put less sulfites in your wines if, if they're taken care of better. 
um, like wine shop or a restaurant keeps them cooler, keeps them laying on their side, and, or a safe way they're standing up on the shelf at 70 degrees. So you have to make your wines a little different. To, um, and prefer to, to not make that kind of wine. Mm -hmm. And Joe won Best of Show at the World of Wine, uh, and he's won the ribbons, but he's done really well with his wine. Which is when we won one of the medals with the Mondeuse Greek, we brought them so well, so that was, we call it Rouge Prestige. Mm -hmm. But an interesting conversation we've been having this week with several winemakers in the area, and um, when we ask the question whether it's one on the Valley Roseburg or here, we, we get a variety of answers as far as what the marketing or business strategy is for selling Oregon wine, and it's so varied and different because Willamette Valley is next to Portland, a metropolitan area. Down here, of course, it's not quite that way. So there's different theories on you know, selling just to restaurants or grocery stores, or people are trying to also get out of Oregon and try to get their wines to the East Coast. Um, so to get to a broader question for you two is, where do you see the larger industry right now, Southern Oregon with the Oregon, larger Oregon area, and how has it evolved? I think, well, the Southern Oregon, uh, region is just exploding. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just going nuts, and the two or three new wineries every year, um, and vineyards, multiple new vineyards every year. So it's we're going to have to look outside of our backyard to sell the wine because it's just a sea of wine coming. Um, which uh, so far we've been saying that for years, and and we have all these beer drinkers converting, and kept us all right. But <laughs> we're all going to have to look outside the state to market the wine eventually. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's a good move. And um, the East Coast has a hard time growing grapes, so that's that's a really valid target, I would think. Mm -hmm. Have you two been able to be involved in some of the local wine associations? Mm -hmm. Joe was a founder of the World of Wine with his friends, Cal Schmidt and the Lincoln Schmidt Family Vineyard and Carpenter Hill. Oh, wonderful. So, they, first year out of their pockets, they paid to start the whole event, and now it's in its, what, 11th year? 11th year, yeah. And what does that event entail? Oh, all those posters, did you see those? Those are all oh, yeah. <laughs> every year. It's about uh, 700 attendees, uh, 60 wineries, um, a lot of food. A week, it's becoming a week of wine. <laughs> uh, instead of uh, just a one night affair. Mm -hmm. Originally it was just a one night party basically that we started to increase our the value of our grapes. We were all grape growers then, we weren't winery people. Now we all three have wineries, but uh, uh, some way to, to just market the grapes and, and increase the value of the grapes in, in Southern Oregon, and bring awareness to Southern Oregon. Mm -hmm. At that time the, the North was everything, Pino was the only grape in the world, and uh, we were just trying to, you know, uh, bring awareness to all the other things that Southern Ring is doing. And it's really worked. Southern Ring has really come around since then, 11 years ago. In the last 11 years, it's like night and day, the industry here. Would you say that's true for pretty much every facet, whether it's growth exponentially, as well as consumers coming in? Has has that changed over the years? I think so, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's um, easier to sell Southern Oregon wine than it ever, ever was before. Mm -hmm. And has a uh, far greater reputation. We have a lot better winemakers here in Southern Oregon now. Um, uh, we're winning all kinds of awards in the Spectator, and a lot of 90 point wines in the Spectator, and so on and so forth. And um, definitely it's, it's working. Mm -hmm. The tide is raising and everybody's floating higher. Mm -hmm. One of the questions we've been exploring is sort of the Southern Oregon identity. and um, There's been a lot of brand Oregon, but there's also, you know, Pinot Noir hints, or Willamette Valley hints that's had on Pinot Noir. And it's sort of the pressure of, okay, well, what is Southern Oregon going to be known for? Is if you could pick one varietal? You know, I have uh, mixed feelings on that. I really do. Um, I think it might be good to pick a variety and go with it. And what variety that is, is, is doesn't really matter, I don't think. But 
I think the re important thing is that the up north is they've already branded Oregon as Pinot, and we can grow better Pinot than they can. So why shouldn't we just jump on those shirt tails and ride their boat? And uh, when they come in to buy our Pinot, they'll buy our Cabernet too. You know, and everything else that we make down here. They'll figure that out. So I want to thank those guys for all the work they've done uh, promoting Pinot and putting us on the map along with them. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy just to ride their boat for a while mm -hmm. and uh, exploit the, all the good things that they've already accomplished. People are all grafting, a lot of people are grafting into Pinot here now, this year. There's always been a lot of Pinot growing here. But it's not, not enough. People are like, you can grow it here, you can't grow it here. But it's just that not a lot of the wine was made here. The grapes were sent up north and, mm -hmm. and it came out with the, you know, an Oregon brand instead of an Applegate brand or Appalachian. But you're going to see a lot more Southern Oregon Pinot in the future, a lot more. I believe it. Uh, just in my two years really focusing on Oregon wine with this project, I would go into tasting shops in Portland and they, you know, there'd be huge rooms and, you know, countries would have entire sections and they'd have an Oregon room and it was almost predominantly Willamette Valley. And so when I asked one of them, where's your Southern Oregon section? They just, two years ago, the, the girl told me like, oh, well, you know, it's, it's basically Kino and, you know, so we had the Willamette Valley Kino. And now, most recently, in these last three months even, I'm seeing a lot more. So it's, it's been wonderful. So a lot of meal. Yeah, yeah. Some of the warmer varieties. And the thing mm -hmm. with ours is we still have things. Good. You know, the temper meal and big wines here are really so Easy to sell, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pinot's easy to sell, too, though. One yeah. thing that JoJo said I think is funny, like when we were trying to figure out how to price wines, he mm -hmm. said, well, they cost all the same to make, and even though some of them have won awards, it's just this, I have to put those in a competition, I don't put all of them in, and I try to make them all way really good. So I said, they're all the same price. <laughs> so then people have to buy what they like. Right, right. And it's so funny because people have a really hard time deciding, so they're trying something like, I don't know, they're and I like all of them, I'm not sure, but if they were different prices, it'd be easier. You know, before you yeah, have said that, Big guy, big shot come in and he's going to buy the most expensive wine no matter what. And the mm -hmm. uh, next little weasel would come in and he's going to buy the cheapest. <laughs> so now they have to decide which wine they like. What they really same like. Same price. Money doesn't enter into it. Right. It's kind of fun. So that's kind of fun. Yeah. Makes it easy. <laughs> well, speaking of favorites, do you have a favorite? Uh, well, I like the Mondeus and I like the Tempranillo and I like the Syrah, I like the Pinot. Mm -hmm. um, it's good, I like it. <laughs> I, just, I, I, I don't have to make that much wine. I don't make it for the masses. I, I just make wine how I like it, and luckily enough, people will like it too. Mm -hmm. we sell it. I think the Mondeuse, I mean, it's, my, I would say, my favorite, but I think part of it is whenever we have that and we drink it out, this makes me think of being over there, and I say mm -hmm. when I'm there, I love it, and I like it, you know. Quarters. And it's a little different than anything else, you know. I like all the, I like all the big ones. <laughs> I like the big ones. Tempranillo is really good here. Mm -hmm. um, now back is really good. Like I said, we can grow any grape really well here. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can find an example of any variety in, on the planet that's grown here and it's grown, done really well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard to pick a favorite. Which is why you called it the world of wine when they did the festival. Because this is a world of wine. Right. This region is a world of wine. That's where the name came from for the event. What have been your biggest challenges or successes in starting a winery and ranch? I, to me, it's the marketing because when we had the dairy, I had a milk truck pulled up and the tankers, they took them out of way, you know, and then they said, your milk truck. We didn't have to do any marketing. It was your problem, their problem to sell the milk. Yeah. Right. And, and so when we started doing this, it was actually getting out and going to restaurants and I've never done that before and to go in and sit, on door. and sit with distributors on a bench waiting to have them taste your wine sometimes is kind of like a little intimidating. But We're just farmers, so the marketing part of it is probably our biggest learning curve. But it wasn't too bad. Luckily, like I said, I'm glad that I like just wine and it's 
I mean, it would be hard to pour somebody's wine if you really didn't like it yourself. Right, At least course. when I pour it, I'm like, this is good, and I know they're going to like it. And it's been... We actually ended up getting in every restaurant that we had written down in the beginning. Oh, good on your dream list. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. Which was really great. There was one that we couldn't get into. They kept saying it was a wine shop. And they were like, we don't have shelf space. But people were going there and asking for the wine all the time. And so then he... They would call us and send the people here, and they, they weren't making anything on it. Right. So they called us one day and said, okay, bring your wine. <laughs> yeah, was, give the people what great. they want. It was great. And so I was like, okay, to get in there. <laughs> so that's been the marketing. I think we agree that's the hardest part. We know how to farm, mm -hmm. and we know how to take the bumps and bruises when Mother Nature throws something at you. Yeah. you know? Right. Yeah, that's been a, a common message we've gotten this week where, you know, it's not easy to grow grapes and make wine, but it's the easiest part in the larger wine industry business. I mean, it, it's the marketing and getting the wine out there and that whole other business side of it is sometimes a lot more difficult and not more not natural, I guess. And we try to do be face forward and we're small enough that we when we do go for places to our, our actually our, our story, you know, just what you're here for today has mm -hmm. really helped us. We have a story. People love the story, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's, that's made it easy. One of the easiest parts of it. Yeah, I think legacy is something that's really important. Not just in Oregon, where you know there's the buy local, sell local, be local, but just to have. Credibility is not the right word because it doesn't encapsulate the emotion involved, but just to have that family legacy is, is very unique. I love it. And I, I mean, they are the greatest people. I mean, if you could ever be in there, I love you. Mm -hmm. And they're just so great. They're so fun. I like it. And they do too. We were, we were served, we were just there in April, we were served the wine across the the counters similar to that. Mm -hmm. And it was the 14th generation of people who had been serving wine across the same counter. Right, right. So the history there is, is really something. And right. to be a part of that kind of gives you, you know, and that's one of the, the hardest parts about um, becoming a winemaker, from a dairy farmer to a winemaker, is uh, trusting your palate, trusting your nose, you know, and, and you know, it's having faith in yourself to make the right decisions. Well, all this history, you know, gives yourself credibility to yeah. think, yeah, you can, do, you can do this. This is what you're made of, you know? Right, this is in your blood. Yeah. So that was been a fun thing to realize that and become confident with that. Mm -hmm. Would you say winemaking and growing grapes is almost genetic? I think that uh, there's something to that. Mm -hmm. Something to the artistic part of it is is in your blood. Either you have it or you don't. I mean, when I say the artistic part of it, I mean, I mean you know, what kind of barrels, and how much oak, or, or um, what varieties you're going to mix to make a blend. Those kind of artistic parts of it, not the science and, and the everyday work and all that. That's anybody can do that. But when it comes right down to those moments when you have to make a decision about blending or um, what, how much oak to use, or how much oak not to use, or those, those kind of decisions are definitely artistic. Mm -hmm. And I never knew I had any art, any, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot of art in dairy business. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mainly it's work, just work. Mm -hmm. Well, that was my formal set of questions. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? I can't think of anything. No, I think you squeezed everything out. That's pretty <laughs> good. All right, that means I'm doing my job. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you both so much for your time and for allowing us to capture the treasures that you have here. And I'll go ahead and turn off the camera so you can feel more comfortable. Okay. Well, thanks for yeah. coming and help promoting us in our story, in our in our vision, and our mission. And I'm hoping one thing with this whole the grape industry here in in the crowds when we were there. One thing his family we were talking about that uh, all of the all of the wineries and vineyards they all work together, they help each other, they, they all work together where I feel like this industry seems to be so new here. Sometimes there seems to be a lot of conflict 
between just the different organizations of the great Garden and winery business. The north and the south and the growers and the wineries. And, it's, it's you know, this the, needs to be all. They're being they are competitive, too competitive, which I understand the business is competition, but uh, in some ways it's not good, I feel. I wish, I wish it wasn't that way. And I hope that we can someday get like they are because they really do work together. And I would like to be like that a lot. Right, yeah, I mean, the common thing we hear is, oh, Oregon, it's so collaborative. But there are also the, the not-so-collaborative sides, because it's, it's a new industry, and we're finding that there, that takes a lot of unique personalities um, that may yes. not be the most cooperative. Together. And a lot of people here that have started, well, I don't know, I should say, they started some of the wineries around here. Anyways, they were professionals in another aspect and they were already or successful and retired or whatever and come here and do it like it's a, a romance degree. You know? Right, like a hobby. And I, they don't really understand, you know, that the farming part of it. Mm -hmm. So some of them I don't think are as happy as they thought they would be doing. <laughs> right. You know, when we had the dairy when we first started going to the wine uh, meetings Nobody really had any producing grape shit. Everybody was just planting, except there were just a handful that were already there, they were old. But everyone was all worked together to help kind of talk, talk about things together. And I thought, wow, this is so much better than the dairy meetings. <laughs> Five years later, when everyone's grapes started coming into production, I saw it break off into little groups. And it's kind of that way. Mm -hmm. Business, business. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully it's able to find a way to come back though. So. Sometimes those are cyclical. Yeah. yeah. Joe said the better it all goes, the higher it, it all we all float. So right. you know, you have to support each other. Mm -hmm. and don't say anything negative about other wineries. When people come here they'll, you know, of course, where should we go? What's whose wine do you like? What's the best? Who you know? And we're really careful saying that. <laughs> Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Just drink Oregon, yeah. <laughs>